uh, my talk uh, entitled STEM, Alewife Restoration uh, and the Art of War. Uh, I got the title from an old book called STEM uh, and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, but the Art of War uh, is actually a, a book uh, from 6th century China. Um, and and uh, it's relevant uh, to warfare today. Uh, it's relevant to the politics. Oh, okay. Is this better? Uh, okay. Um, because of the location of the speakers, I can't hear uh, what you hear. I'd like to uh, depart from my presentation for just a moment. Uh, and bring a, a really good book uh, to your attention. I, I, I don't know, by any odd chance, is uh, Franklin Burroughs in, in the audience tonight? Uh, he's a resident of the area. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he's a member of the Friends of Merry Meeting Bay. Uh, if you're interested in Merry Meeting Bay, uh, this is just a, a great book. Uh, very, very well written and uh, uh, it covers many, many different aspects of the history and, and the ecology of Merry Meeting Bay. Uh, my talk isn't particularly about the biology uh, of alewives. Uh, it's about the political tactics uh, of restoration, uh, using my uh, experiences on Weber Pond as an example. Uh, I'm hoping the ideas will be interesting. I'm, I'm hoping the ideas may be something that can be applied to other locations, other projects. Um, why I feel like the Forrest Gump of alewives. Uh, you may remember the structure uh, of the, the movie Forrest Gump, where Forrest uh, sits on a bench, evidently waiting for a bus. And as various people come and sit on the same bench, uh, he narrates the, the story of his life. Uh, in my case, uh, I sit on the bench and various people come and uh, sit beside me and uh, narrate the, the story of alewives, narrate the story uh, of many uh, uh, different lake issues. And uh, I'm not a professional biologist. I'm, I'm very grateful for the information that uh, uh, quite a number of people have given to me uh, over the years. There's no uh, philosophical quip that's perfect. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, the name may sound familiar, he is the person who invented the geodesic dome. Uh, but he was also uh, a writer and a bit of a philosopher. Uh, and alewives, in many respects, are a, a new model for uh, uh, environmental uh, improvement. Uh, it's always better to be in favor of something than against something. Uh, strategically, I think it's much more effective to be in favor of alewife restoration as opposed to simply being opposed uh, to dams. Uh, there's no quip that's perfect, but uh, uh, the alewives uh, give us the potential for reconnecting habitat, uh, reconnecting uh, the interior uh, uh, with the ocean. The alewives are like the wildebeest of the ocean, uh, and uh, they're a very important means of exchanging uh, nutrients between the, the two ecosystems. Uh, Alewives uh, were extirpated uh, at a, about the same time as Atlantic salmon. Uh, they're not as beautiful as, as salmon, uh, but they're, they're arguably a, a much more important uh, uh, keystone species, and their restoration has uh, uh, many positive I implications. Uh, as the president of a lake association, uh, the alewives' capability of improving water quality is very important. And I'll go into more detail uh, about that later in the show. Um, also, uh, alewives combine uh, environmental improvement and economic development. Uh, they can bring uh, 
environmental activists and lobster bait dealers uh, in, into alliance together. Um, there's, there's very few uh, things that can do that. Uh, the Art of War by Sun Tzu, uh, a little more of, of, of a return to, to literature. This is a great book. Uh, it was written in the sixth century uh, in China. Uh, it's comparable in many respects to uh, The Prince by Machiavelli, uh, except that this is uh, about uh, actual warfare. Uh, it's easily generalizable to, to many other endeavors, however. Um, seeking allies. Uh, it's very rare that one person is in a position to really do uh, everything. In order to be effective, you need to have allies. Uh, we all need friends. Uh, even the Lone Ranger needed Tonto. Uh, understanding the terrain, understanding the environment, uh, and creating tactics that are adapted to the circumstances at hand. Uh, that's very important, uh, uh, not just for warfare, but also for alewife restoration. And I'll give you a few examples of that uh, later uh, in the talk. Don't lay siege to wall cities. Uh, I love that one, um, but this general from the 6th century uh, spent uh, approximately a, a chapter of his book explaining uh, that a small number of people can hold a, a, a walled city against a vast army, uh, and it costs a lot of money. He had so many pounds of silver per day to keep an army of 100,000 troops in the field, and he, he asserted, uh, that uh, it would break the treasury if you did it very often. And uh, when it was all over, you might not have that much. Uh, instead, he advocated uh, trying to choose, trying to dictate uh, the time and place of battle, uh, picking uh, battles where your enemy or your opponent uh, is relatively weak uh, and you're uh, in a, a position of relative advantage. Uh, he also advocated long preparation, but very short, decisive values, or short, decisive battles. And uh, I'll give an example of that uh, la later on in the talk. Uh, restoration is more than a, a science. I will uh, assert that it's a series of battles, really a series of projects in a, a long process that's uh, going to take uh, decades to unfold. Um, good science, it's obviously necessary for the long term, uh, but grossly inefficient in most uh, individual uh, battles. Uh, scientific debate is not uh, a primary interest to uh, decision makers. Usually they have many uh, different uh, issues on their agenda. Uh, they're not uh, in a position to enjoy the intellectual stimulation of scientific debate. They want to get something over with and go on to the next uh, item in their agenda. Um, by way of science and terrain, uh, government agencies are uh, not staffed for uh, the enterprise of opening up uh, rivers, or opening up uh, passageways, building fishways, and doing the political prep work. Um, governmental agents typically can provide some scientific consulting, uh, but they're, they're just not staffed uh, to be able to uh, undertake large-scale large projects at this time. Uh, political leaders additionally uh, generally not engaged with a niche issue like alewife restoration. Uh, they can be recruited, uh, but it's, it's never going to be something that's at the top of the list. And accordingly, in, in this environment, uh, and probably for the foreseeable future, uh, it's private uh, organizations that are going to be leading the charge. Alliances. Uh, Sea-run eowives benefit many parties. I mean, 
The exact benefit uh, is different. However, it doesn't detract from a common interest, doesn't detract from people being able to work together. And uh, as I said in the intro, it's very unusual to find something that can, can bring together lobster bait dealers, municipal officials, lake associations, environmental activists. <coughs> One of the things that makes uh, eel wife restoration today so appealing uh, to lake associations uh, is that eel wives have the capability of offsetting excess phosphorus in a lake which contributes to ugly, ugly uh, algae blooms like this one. Uh, as many of you I think know, I realize this is, is a sophisticated audience, uh, alewives eat zooplankton, zooplankton eat the algae. When the alewives eat the zooplankton, they sequester the phosphorus or a lot of it in their bodily tissues and take it out of the equation. Uh, over a, a period of time, uh, alewives in a lake uh, can offset so much phosphorus. Uh, they also export it. They take it completely out of the system when they outmigrate uh, uh, back to the ocean uh, in the fall. Uh, they can take a lake that looks like this and, and have it be virtually clear. And uh, uh, lake associations like that. Uh, this is a crate of eel wives. Uh, that guy with the tattoo on his arm uh, is an employee of the eel wife harvester. Um, that crate is worth about $75. And they get uh, hundreds, thousands of crates, even at a relatively small lake like Weber Pond. Uh, the town gets a third of the cut. Uh, a year or so ago, the town of Vassalboro got $10,000 as its cut. Uh, municipal officials like that. And I, I, I will say uh, that the town of Vassalboro uh, puts the money uh, back into the lakes in Vassalboro. Uh, they use the money in, from my point of view, a uh, very responsible way. Uh, but they're still happy to get it. Uh, they're happy it enables them uh, uh, to, to do more. I assert that the harvest is absolutely essential uh, to uh, alewife restoration. Uh, it opens up many alliances and it, it opens up uh, an ability to establish relationships with elected officials. Uh, that woman in the middle with the net is State Representative uh, Lori Fowl from Vassalboro. Uh, she's having a great time. Uh, uh, it's very uh, non-demanding. Uh, I'm not asking her to do anything. I'm just explaining a little bit about eel wives. And uh, like most people, she's pretty much like a kid, uh, dipping them uh, out, out of the harvest uh, plume, the, the cement uh, pool there. Uh, where they're, they're held, well, they're taken out uh, with nets. Uh, Lori Fowl is a Democrat. Uh, however, I've also had uh, State Senator uh, Roger Cates uh, from Augusta and uh, a former state representative from Vassalboro, who's a Republican, uh, come down for the same kind of uh, uh, tour. And they reacted just the same way. They were. Uh, having a great time and very interested in eel wives, which they'd had no uh, previous exposure to. Um, there's a certain amount of fun uh, that's associated with it, but also uh, politically, uh, people enjoy uh, being associated with a success story uh, and uh, elected officials can intuitively recognize that the restoration is good for the community in a very general uh, kind of a way. It's good for economic development, it's good for water quality, uh, it's just a good thing. Uh, in the back there, uh, in the uh, uh, yellow uh, jacket, is another state representative. Uh, in, in the front further on is another shot of 
of Lori Fowle. Uh, I, I think you can see the big uh, smile on her face. And the, the gentleman uh, in the green uh, parka uh, is uh, a member of the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. He is State Representative Ralph Tucker from Brunswick, who is uh, sitting right here. Um, Representative Tucker uh, introduced a bill uh, recently on, on my behalf uh, to help uh, manage uh, the outlet streams that connect lakes to the main stem of the river. Uh, we're going to go to a work session uh, on, that, on that bill tomorrow. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is the harvest opens up uh, establishing cooperative, productive relationships with elected officials, which is very powerful. Uh, you can all see the uh, distinguished looking gentleman with the white hair uh, holding the net in the middle there. Uh, if Mike Michaud had picked up 3% uh, more votes in the last gubernatorial election, uh, we would have a governor on our side uh, for the first time uh, in history. And that would open up fascinating possibilities. You could get uh, fish ladder construction uh, included as part of statewide bonding packages. Uh, you could call up the governor's office and get assistance on this project or the other project. Uh, it, it would have been a, a, a really big deal. Uh, we came up a little short, but it uh, uh, shows you the possibilities. Uh, now, uh, the, the comedic uh, part of the story. Uh, why did things go so well on Weber Pond and so badly on the St. Croix? A controversy that I, I suspect many of you are familiar with. Um, I will assert that it was at first just simple bad luck on the St. Croix uh, and uh, good luck on Weber Pond. Uh, on Weber Pond uh, afterwards, uh, it's an example of the, port the importance of political prep work. Uh, to recruit uh, allies. Uh, finally, uh, it's a testament uh, to the alewives themselves. Uh, alewives are a good thing, and, and uh, given a chance to prove themselves, uh, the vast majority of people will uh, recognize them as a good thing. Um, we don't have a, a laser pointer with us. Uh, this is a, a map uh, of the St. Croix. It's quite a large uh, scale map. And I'm going to try to go over this, this point a little bit. This uh, headwater lake, Spendic Lake, is 17 miles long. It's a rather large river. And the uh, main fish ladder is right here. It's called uh, Grand Falls Dam. And we've got St. Stephen on the map. But uh, right on the other side of the river is uh, Calais, Maine. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's Calais or Callis. <laughs> it is Callis. Um, that lake is a major uh, storage. Uh, area for water that's ultimately used for uh, power generation uh, at uh, power plants further on down the river in the general area of, of uh, St. Stephen's. And that, that's an important uh, detail. A trip down uh, Nightmare Lane. Um, in the mid-60s, in the, mid uh, the Department of Marine Resources uh, opened a fish ladder, uh, and they didn't do stocking. They just let a remnant population in the lower part of the river ascend the ladder and reestablish themselves. Uh, it took a full 20 years for the population of alewives uh, to reach a, a large volume. And uh, it's hard to unscramble uh, the history of what happened 30 years ago. Uh, but I will never know, I'll never understand why they didn't introduce a harvest. Uh, they would have recruited uh, all kinds of friends in the area, uh, but they didn't have uh, any friends at all when uh, a crisis occurred. 
uh, just at about the same time that the eelwife population started to recover, the smallmouth bass fishery in Spendic Lake crashed. Uh, smallmouth bass uh, is uh, the business in that remote part of the state. Uh, there's a, a well-organized uh, uh, guiding organization. Uh, there's several uh, sporting camps. And uh, the, their business was very severely affected. At that time, there was a lot less that was known uh, about sea run eel wives. And uh, I, I, I have to say that uh, you know, the uh, Department of Marine Resources had almost no uh, uh, public relations capability. Uh, they had so little public relations capability. Uh, I don't think they understood that they couldn't just do it, that uh, they needed to recruit friends and allies amongst uh, the local population and local area political leaders. Uh, the Department of Marine Resources and the Canadian biologists opined that 14-foot drawdowns on that headwater lake, which is about 30 feet uh, uh, deep. They were taking about half the water out of the lake for uh, power generation uh, during the summer months. And um, obviously, that couldn't have been very good for the bass population. Uh, they opined that, that that was the uh, excessive drawdowns were the reason for the collapse of the fishery. Unfortunately, uh, the IFNW biologists opined that the problem was alewives. And I can see why uh, those alewives just looked guilty. <laughs> um, there's a difference uh, between uh, correlation and causation. There's a difference between just coincidence and cause and effect. Uh, and that difference uh, uh, is usually uh, replication. If it's cause and effect, the results can be uh, replicated. And for unclear reasons, uh, the IFNW biologists didn't uh, uh, take into account uh, that there are, are many, there were at that time many lakes in Maine that had both sea run eelwives and very healthy small run uh, bass populations. Then as time went along and there were restorations on uh, other lakes in Maine, uh, uh, the smallmouth bass population, the fishing in general, uh, if anything, uh, it was improved. And so the, the results were never replicated. Uh, however, uh, I, I, I will have to uh, give uh, some uh, consideration to the IFNW biologists. They were forced uh, to offer an opinion under emergency conditions. It was a verbal opinion. Uh, there was never any report, written report issued. There was never any data. It was just a verbal opinion. And exactly what they said is lost to history. Uh, what they actually said may have been much more nuanced uh, than they get credit for today. But having said that, uh, I would nominate uh, those biologists for a Hall of Fame award in the Power of Persuasion Hall of Fame. Uh, 25 years later, uh, those guides uh, still absolutely adamantly believe uh, that it was the eel wives that, that caused that fishery to collapse uh, all that time ago. Uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Washington County legislators introduced a bill to close the fish ladder, and it passed. Um, I believe in 2011, uh, might have been 2012, uh, a new statute uh, finally reopened the fish ladder in, on the St. Croix. However, the, the next uh, legislative session, or close to it, uh, a bill was introduced to close the fish ladder again. Uh, that bill is still pending, uh, and uh, the controversy uh, on the St. Croix uh, is still far from over. 
In contrast, uh, Weber Pond, it's a much smaller pond. Uh, it's off the main stream or off the main stem uh, of the Kennebec River. And uh, you can see on the map that little outlet stream that connects Weber to uh, the Kennebec. And the alewives uh, swim up that, uh, enter Weber Pond, have their annual trip to Las Vegas. Uh, the adults very quickly uh, exit. Uh, I have been at the fish ladder, which is right where, it ent right where the stream enters Weber Pond. And I've seen uh, adult eowise coming up the fish ladder in order to spawn, and adults that have already spawned uh, going over uh, the control gates of the dam on their way uh, back uh, to the ocean. We've never had an instance of an adult eowise staying in the pond over the summer. We've never had an instance of a juvenile alewife uh, not exiting the pond uh, in the fall to, uh, to go back uh, to the ocean. Uh, however, things didn't get started really great. Uh, in 1997, uh, DMR began uh, the Weber Pond Project uh, without telling anybody, uh, but people found out and uh, there was a whole lot of controversy. Uh, and they were just one phone call away from legislation being introduced to prohibit EOIs on Weber, uh, which would have sailed through the legislature. It would have been just a, a done deal. And we think we live in a logical, rational, linear kind of a world, uh, but often just pure chance. Uh, dictates events. And the difference on Weber was it was close to Augusta. The vice president of the Lake Association worked for the Department of Marine Resources. Uh, and the treasurer of the association had uh, a son that worked uh, for the Department of Marine Resources. And the two of them blocked that phone call. Now that's the only reason it wasn't made. Uh, and then, uh, uh, here's where I start to come into the picture. In 1997, I'm at my house, blissfully drinking beer and watching television. The phone rings. Uh, and, and, and this woman says, hi, my name is Shirley Shea. My husband Jim met you ice fishing out on the pond. And he said that you might be interested in coming to this meeting we're having. And, uh, you know, I, I did. Uh, it was one of the most acrimonious meetings that I've, I've ever been to. Uh, it was about alewives. And uh, uh, people were uh, uh, mad that they hadn't been consulted. Uh, and uh, many of the people there barely understood the difference between an alewife and a piranha. Uh, DMR, instead of sending a, a commissioner, a deputy commissioner, or somebody with uh, public uh, speaking experience, uh, three biologists from, from DMR attended that meeting. And uh, um, I, I got to know some of them afterwards. They were, they were good people. They were technical biologists. But they'd obviously gone to the Bambi in the Headlights School of Public Speaking. Uh, they were just helpless to defend themselves. Um, well, now, the importance of, of preparation. Uh, a, a few years later, uh, I became the president of the Weber Pond Association. And uh, ultimately, in, in 2006, there was a near unanimous vote to build the fish ladder. It was a constant uh, uh, political type process. Um, there was another uh, piece of luck. Uh, shortly after I became president, uh, I knew there was a new biologist in charge of the area. And uh, I uh, asked him to come to the meeting, make a presentation, write articles for our newsletter. And just in, in an act of God's mercy, uh, this was somebody that had public speaking skills, uh, 
a, a personality that most people just intuitively liked. He was, in fact, a, a member of the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. Uh, his name is Nate uh, Gray. Uh, uh, Nate, I believe, is the treasurer. Uh, he can't be here tonight. Nate is at another uh, meeting uh, speaking about ill lives. Uh, I was going to enjoy making a whole bunch of jokes at his expense, but since he's not here, I can't do that. Um, after three years of presentations about the merits of alewife restoration uh, and, and a series of articles in our newsletter, uh, I mean, it took three years. That was the prep work. Finally, we come to the annual meeting. The fish ladder is just one thing of several uh, on uh, the agenda. Uh, we get to that agenda item, and uh, I call for a motion to endorse uh, construction of the fish ladder. There's a little bit of debate, then there's a vote, and there's just one dissenting vote out of, out of maybe 30 or 40 people attending. And it was just uh, uh, that preparation it was completely misleading. Uh, the very calm moment of truth when the motion was uh, uh, enacted and, and the very long period of preparation that, that led up to it. Uh, afterwards, uh, the town began to collect money. The town manager went from saying to me, oh, I hope this ill wife harvest isn't going to be a pain in the neck. Uh, to saying, hey, this, this is going pretty good. Uh, we got another break, uh, just complete good luck. The eelwife harvester turned out to be a real nice person and a really competent person. So there weren't any issues or problems with the harvest itself. Then the lake cleared up, and after a few years, total strangers would, would interact with me, not knowing that I was the president of the organization, not knowing that I'd done all that prep work to get the fish ladder built. I think, oh, those alewives, they cleaned up this pond really good. They're, they're just something else. Uh, I mean, and uh, today, uh, there's just strong uh, public and uh, uh, political and local political support uh, for the restoration and for the ladder. Now, it's a little bit misleading. Uh, this is a design of a fish ladder called a Denali Steep Pass fish ladder uh, from uh, Alaska where, where they're common. And there's a lot more engineering built into that uh, than, than uh, you th see at first. You can see all the white water on top, the uh, harsh current on top. Well, it's uh, hydro-engineered, or hydraulically engineered, uh, uh, so that the fast water on top actually creates a very, very calm layer underneath. Uh, there's fins and, and other gizmos at, at the bottom of it. And so the eelwives have a very, very easy uh, uh, swim uh, un underneath the heavier current on top. The uh, steep pass fish ladder has another advantage, too. They were designed for trout in Alaska. And trout can swim up that fish ladder very, very easily. Uh, however, uh, bass, white perch, yellow perch, carp, northern pike, white catfish, uh, other fish besides trout and eelwives have a lot of trouble utilizing the fish ladder. And uh, one of the uh, arguments, it's not an argument I agree with, it's just one of the arguments about opening up uh, uh, riverine ecosystems is, is that it will uh, cause exotic species to go all over the place and destroy the universe. Uh, the bass, the, the, the warm water species are a little bit too big, typically, to take advantage of the calm water that's underneath. And they're not as well engineered for fighting currents as trout and, and alewives are. But when that argument is raised, you can say with the Denali fish ladder, hey, hey, don't worry about it. 
uh, those horrible fish can't go up the fish ladder, so don't worry about it. And uh, that can be handy. That can be a handy counter argument. Um, what does success look like? Um, uh, just, just having all that public support for the restoration. It caused Weber Pond to be a bit of a beachhead uh, in the area. Uh, because of the success on Weber, uh, there's been an opening up of another pond in the area, Three Mile Pond, another pond, uh, Patti Pond, and underway at this time, uh, that's the meeting that Nate is going to tonight, is a project to open up uh, China Lake. Uh, and already, uh, the selectmen in Vassalboro and the town of China have actually committed money to it. Uh, those two towns have put in something in the general neighborhood of $60,000 just to get things started. And um, um, I'm, I'm proud to be a resident of Vassalboro. I'm proud to be a resident of the area. Uh, you just can't uh, a ask for more than our local officials are, are doing for us. Uh, here's a look at China Lake. And it's a much uh, larger lake. It's about three times the size of Weber. And you can see this outlet stream uh, going up to the Canada. That's going to be a much tougher project because there are five dams on it. There's five places that they've got to open up fish passage. Uh, but with uh, the support uh, and the number of people working on it, uh, it's, it's going to happen. Uh, the model for future restoration efforts, the political model, I would say, is, uh, in my humble opinion, one discrete project at a time not getting distracted by going after wall cities. Just one battle at a time. Uh, uh, battles that are at a scale uh, that a relatively small organization uh, can manage. Uh, keeping the harvest uh, a central feature uh, of the restoration. Uh, that, that harvest lends itself uh, to making useful friends uh, with from people from many different backgrounds. And uh, uh, fi finally, in the model, uh, local elected officials, both municipal officials and uh, your, your local state representatives and state senators are very fundamental allies. If you don't have them on board, uh, sooner or later you're going to have problems. It may not look like they're doing a whole lot at any particular moment in time, uh, but uh, occasions do evolve where their support is just absolutely critical. Who organizes these projects? Uh, that's today still a bit of a work in progress. Uh, the Lake Association, with consulting from DMR, uh, it has played a, a lead role in a couple of lakes. On another lake, on an, on a, another lake in the area, a regional lake association, the China Region Lakes Alliance, played a role. We're starting to see ad hoc groups such as the Penobscot River Trust uh, that has removed the dams up in the Bangor area. Uh, these are new things that uh, uh, haven't been seen before and. Uh, I, I don't know whether they're the beginning or something or if they're a transition. Uh, there is actually uh, a group similar to the uh, Penobscot uh, River Restoration Trust uh, called the China Lake Stream Restoration Project that's uh, leading the charge on China Lake. And DMs off the, the main stem, they're good targets. They're good, they're battles that you can win because typically those dams don't have uh, a use anymore. They don't have any uh, economic interests obstructing their removal. And I'll assert that gain control over those sites uh, is the first step. The technical issue of how to create fish passage, you can deal with that after you've got control of the site. Uh, outright purchase is best. Uh, dam removal is the best way to uh, institute fish passage. 
here, here's an example of the, the type of uh, DM that's out there. Um, nobody wants this. The landowner uh, probably can't afford to have it removed. Uh, it's just been there for uh, probably close to a century, but with a relatively small amount of money, just, you know, discussion. Maybe, for t maybe it would cost $10,000 to get an excavator in there for a couple of days and just rip it out and, and clear it up. Those are the ki kinds of battles uh, that are, are appropriate and perfectly winnable today. In, in closing, the wall city of uh, government is likely to uh, be impenetrable for years to come. Uh, even money at the federal level is obstructed now because of the sequestration that occurred in Washington due to uh, a gridlock about the budget. Uh, natural resource agencies in Maine and in many other states, to, to, be, to be fair, uh, are understaffed, under-resourced, uh, not, not set up uh, to provide a, a whole lot of project leadership on, on this. I like the analogy of football, uh, just doing one play at a time. Uh, acquiring sites with uh, obsolete dams seems to be an opportunity at this point. And finally, uh, financing fish passage is a work in progress. Uh, we're seeing uh, municipalities being ready to participate. There's some money still out there at the, at the federal level, but uh, financing all this remains a bit of an unsolved problem. And uh, with, with that, uh, I will close. That's the uh, end of my presentation. Uh, if uh, people have comments, I'm, I'm happy to listen. If people have questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Uh, last year was uh, a record year. Uh, we know that uh, there's a harvest four days a week, and there's a count three days a week. And uh, the count was uh, uh, 360,000 uh, adults. Uh, but uh, they don't count uh, fish when they harvest, they count crates. And so you need to, to do uh, estimating uh, to get the total size of the run. But it was getting close to 900,000 fish. That the water quality improved a lot a few years after the airlines were introduced dramatically. Uh, at first, people said, oh, well, yeah, it's the cumulative effect of the drawdowns we've been doing. Um, it's the cumulative effect of erosion control projects. And then, uh, maybe the airlines had something to do with it. Uh, but it wasn't very long before even those uh, diehards said, yeah, it's the Yale Wives. How, um, how much did the fish, uh, the fish ladder cost and who paid for it? You can see me smirk. Uh, the process of raising money for that was uh, 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 complex at best. And in an earlier version of my talk, I had a long war story about what we had to do to raise money. But uh, uh, it reminded me of that t-shirt that said, uh, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying hard enough. <laughs> uh, that fish ladder was not cheap. That fish ladder doesn't look like much. But because of the engineering, because of the bureaucratic overhead of dealing with, I believe, three different uh, uh, federal funding sources and just all the, the regulations and rigmarole and processes, uh, that fish ladder cost in the general area of $200,000. And uh, I mean, that, that, that's what it costs if you're gonna get federal financing. It would be much, much, much less uh, if uh, an alternative form of financing was available. It was uh, 1997, um, but very significantly, the uh, Edwards Dam, 
was scheduled for removal a little bit afterwards, uh, thus opening up the uh, uh, the outlet stream of Weber to the Kennebec. And they believed that they had the uh, statutory authority to, to do it uh, and, and do, I mean, uh, due to uh, a lack of sophistication, in my opinion, uh, uh, they, they, they just did it. I mean, th there's this, this joke about uh, the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy were told to secure a building. Uh, the Army uh, sends in an assault squad. The Navy levels the building with artillery from a ship 30 miles offshore. Uh, and the Air Force signs a 40-year lease. <laughs> uh, and and when, when told to restore your wives, the Department of Marine Resources just backs up the stock truck. And, and uh, today, uh, they know better. Uh, they, 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 I think that they've learned a lesson from how well Weber Pond went. But in, in 1997, they just backed up the stock truck. Uh, Nate Gray, who many of you, of you know, evidently, uh, actually drove the first stock truck that uh, put airlines into Weber Pond. Uh, our wildebeest uh, is, is uh, uh, like a deer in Africa, uh, and everything eats them. And they travel uh, long distances all over the Serengeti Plain. And uh, those mass migrations are very important to uh, uh, animals being able to eat all through that whole area. Uh, the alewife uh, spends its life in the ocean where it's eaten uh, by everything. The alewife provides forage for uh, ocean fish, literally from Maryland to Iceland. Uh, and the alewife also, as it uh, uh, migrates on its spawning run, provides forage for many, many uh, different kinds of fish, for eagles, for minks, for seals, just all kinds of stuff. But the alewife also completes that long uh, migration where it provides food for many different species. The, the reason alewives are exporting phosphorus is the juvenile fish that are born in the lake are uh, based on Damariscotta data, it's about eight times the fish tissue, the fish biomass is leaving that lake as the adults that come and go. And so not all the, you know, there's some mortality of adults that would leave nutrients. But you, so just think about that, eight times the biomass that the only, all the, the only way they can get phosphorus is from that lake, and they're leaving with it. Um, in terms of Mary Meaning Bay, again, there's some spawning, and uh, these fish, you know, leave in basically July through October, and they need to grow a bunch, eat a bunch, and grow a bunch, and Mary Meaning Bay is like di uh, direct nursery habitat from fish coming down both, um, both big rivers and the small, smaller rivers as well. And, and so, it, it, historically, it was probably really important, and it, and it still is, and it's... Mary, as a lot of big, big parts of Marinini Bay, the, the habitat is recovering nicely.